Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Contemporary Islamic Issues and Concepts on Huda TV. I'm your host, Arkham Rashid. On today's episode, we will be speaking about the Islamic ideology of ijtihad. And we're going to start off by welcoming and introducing our guest, Sheikh Asim Al Hakim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the show, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Jazakumullah khair for having me. And it's uh, wonderful to have you on. Uh, Sheikh, so uh, ijtihad is an Islamic concept uh, that's, you know, been there from the beginning of Islam all the way till now. Uh, many people don't know what it is, but it's, uh, it's always been there. It's nothing contemporary, but what we want to do is give it a contemporary look and, and basically define and try to understand why we need it today. Uh, so let's start off by the definition of ijtihad. What is ijtihad uh, as a term, as a principle? What is it? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan lil alameen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ijtihad is one of the sources of the rulings in Islamic law or jurisprudence or sharia. You call it whatever you want to call it. So we have the Quran, and we have the Sunnah, and we have the consensus of the Muslims, of the scholars. So here, you don't have any ishtihad. You don't have any reason to strive and find out the ruling of something, because it's crystal clear from the Quran, from the Sunnah, or from the consensus. Now, when it comes to issues that we're not mentioned in the Quran. Some say that the verses of fiqh or jurisprudence or sharia ah mentioned in the Quran do not mount to more than 500. Mm -hmm. Some even make them 150. So these 500 are either repeated or uh, can be used so in this, on the same topic. So they minimize it to 150 verses of 6,000 plus. Wow. So they say that the rulings are fixed. Allah Azza wa Jal gives us general rules to govern by. The Prophet ﷺ, in his prophetic teachings and hadith would elaborate and explain. So the 150 verses would even branch more and more. There are things that the scholars understand by common sense. So they all agree without any difference between scholars on a ruling. So this is a consensus. And as mentioned in chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, that whoever goes against the consensus of the Muslims would be punished severely in hell, which means that this is something to be taken seriously. But what about what is happening nowadays, which was not mentioned in the Quran, the Sunnah, nor the consensus of scholars. Now, this is a dilemma because those who are rigid and not having the ability to evolve and to be contemporary mm -hmm. with new issues and concepts in Islam would refrain from giving a verdict and hence put the Muslims in hardship. So there's a new issue that we want to address. And there are so many, whether these issues are in transactions, like Islamic banking, mm -hmm. or in medicine, or in any other field that is needed urgently, even in forms of worship, praying on an airplane. Yeah. If you look in the old books, it's, it's not, not mentioned. Mm -hmm. So people say, ha, huh, you're not allowed to pray on a, a, an airplane. Why? Because prayer, you're supposed to be standing on earth and prostrating on earth. Now you're nowhere. You're in the middle between the heavens and the earth. So your prayer is invalid, blah, blah, blah. In fasting, you got so many things. And maybe we, if you wish, we can talk about you know, samples and examples yeah, sure. of it in Hajj, in uh, uh, giving zakat, all of these things. So I I there are two different terminologies. We have ishtihad versus taqlid. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Ishtihad means, in a nutshell, to strive and do whatever is in your capability to reach an Islamic ruling. That was not mentioned in the Quran, Sunnah, or the consensus. Okay. So some, because if someone says, Akhi, I'd like to make ishtihad hmm. in the ruling on uh, uh, consuming uh, okay. tequila. Hmm. Sp uh, Mexico was not invented, that, or was not discovered at the time of the Prophet. We know of wine. So what's ruling on tequila? He says, yes, yeah, okay, hey, I'm doing ishtihad. Or drugs were not at the time of the Prophet. So what's your ruling on, on doing crack? Well, no problem. It's, this is my ishtihad. Then we have to know what are the conditions that must be ful fulfilled in a person making ishtihad. Is it for every mm. Tom, Dick, and Harry? Yeah, we're going to get into that as well. Who is allowed to do ishtihad? Who's okay, so this mm. is striving in doing your best to the best of your ability and capability to reach an Islamic ruling mm. on a particular concept or an issue. Versus taqlid. Mm. Now taqlid is to be stagnant in your thinking. So we have the four Imams who were mujtahid. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Muha Malik ibn Anas, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal. The four great Imams of the four schools of thought that every Muslim know about. Mm. However, their disciples, their students, those who adored them and their teachings and followed it, went to a stage of being stagnant in their thinking and only following their principles and their views as if it were a revelation. So when they are faced with a verse from the Quran, or from the hadith of the Prophet that goes against what their Imam said, they say the Imam knows better. Mm. My understanding of the Quran and of the Sunnah does not elevate to these Imams. And this is a grave and serious mistake that a lot of not only the masses of the Muslims, but some who are considered to be scholars had fallen in. Why? Because they were at the fork of the road. If I choose the Quran and the Sunnah, then I would be a going against my ancestors' way of uh, 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 Thinking, practicing mm -hmm. uh, Islam. And then I would be like the black sheep of the family. But if I follow what the majority say, um, I'm just following an imam. Mm. So here we have a big problem between ishtihad and taqlid. Okay, um, so we're going to get into who can make ijtihad. Like you said, you know, there are certain times you have to look at who's making this ijtihad. Uh, but before I actually get into that, I want to get into the purpose of ijtihad. Why is ijtihad there? What are the reasons behind it? Uh, why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just reveal everything in the Quran? Why is it, somebody might ask, well, if the Quran is the book of God, then why doesn't it contain all the rulings we need? You know, okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the Quran is enough. This is... You know, uh, this bayan, you know, has everything in it that you need to understand your life and everything. So why do we need ijtihad? That's a very valid and good question. But to answer it, it's not a yes or no question. Mm -hmm. So you have to, first of all, understand what Quran really is. The Quran is a miracle. It is not created. It is the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's not a creation of Allah, it's one of his attributes. And Allah the Almighty spoke it and revealed it. And we have it as a miracle till the end of time. Unlike other scriptures that were revealed for a specific uh, period of time and then it was due their expiry date. Mm -hmm. Quran does not expire. It is till the end of time. Quran is concise and gives general rulings, but within it, it has the answer for everything, providing 
that you follow it to the letter. What does that mean? You cannot simply come to the Quran and say, I am going to abide by the Quran and nothing else. Like those known as Quraniyun. So they reject the Sunnah, they reject the Salaf, they reject the companions. Whatever they said, they said, we don't know if it's authentic or not. So we just rely on the Quran. This is totally prohibited and it is an act of apostasy to neglect these sources of Sharia and only depend on the Quran. They say, Allah Azza wa said that in the Quran, ma farratna fil kitab min shay. So there's nothing that we missed in the kitab. Akhi, the ayah is referring to the Lawh al mahfuz the preserved tablet that has everything written down since Allah created the creation till the end of time. Not to the Quran. But even if we so go with you and say it is in the Quran, you have to take everything to the letter where the Prophet says, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُهُ Whatever the Prophet, whatever the Messenger of Allah brings to you, you must take it. Take it. Meaning even his teachings, and this is why the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, لَا أَلْفَيَنَّ رَجُلًا مِنْكُمْ مُتَّكِعًا عَلَىٰ أَرِيكَتِهَا I do not want to see any of you leaning down in his couch saying, whatever we find in the Quran, we take it. And whatever we do not find in the Quran, we reject it. By Allah, he goes on to say, I was giving the Quran and similar to it, that is the Sunnah, with it. So these are the two revelations. So yes, you can abide by the Quran, but you have to have the understanding of the Sunnah. Mm -hmm. Now, when having the understanding of the Sunnah, you need to, as we've stated earlier, refer back to the Quran. And in, in two verses of the Quran, Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ you, should, you must ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. So I have the Quran and I have the Sunnah. Why should we have ishtihad? Because you may not understand every single ayah in the Quran. Mm -hmm. To the uh, 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 account that some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, misunderstood verses of the Quran. And it was corrected to them by the Prophet And it was corrected to them by the masses and the majority of companions. So it's not your ishtihad against mine. It is what the majority of scholars look into and stem from the Quran and Sunnah. So the Quran itself is not sufficient without the Sunnah. And the Quran and the Sunnah must be understood not by my or your uh, intellect, but by the understanding of the Salaf, the, right, the three righteous generations that the Prophet said, yes. that they are the best of all genera genera generations. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so for now basically what I understand from the purpose behind uh, Ijtihad is that the Quran gives you general rulings and within those general rulings there are ways for us to extract rulings for everything Correct. Uh, that we find. Um, and like you said, it's not for everybody to make. It's, uh, you know, فَسَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That to ask those who know, if you don't understand a verse, if you don't uh, know something. Before we get into who can actually conduct ijtihad, uh, let's uh, actually give some examples of uh, ijtihads that are, that are done nowadays. Uh, something that's new that we didn't have a ruling for that was maybe extracted through the method of ijtihad. Uh, can you give me some examples inshallah? The sky is the limit <laughs> and we have to know that there are so many fields that have been introduced to Islam and Islam has found the answer to and this shows you that the religion has two parts of it. One part that is not touchable. Mm. You cannot touch this. So someone says, Akhi, we have to make ishtihad regarding the prohibition of fornication. Nowadays, we have new medical ways of preventing pregnancy, of uh, preventing uh, uh, STDs uh, from, uh, cat from, you, from yeah. you catching it. May Allah forbid, uh, we, do, we have this and this and this. So we said, no, this is fixed. So one says, okay, let's change the prescribed punishments. 
chopping off hands for those who steal, flogging those who slander or uh, um, consume intoxicants or uh, commit fornication, stoning. said, no, this has no room for ishtihad. Because the general ruling is that la ishtihada ma'an nas. There is no ishtihad when there is evidence, clear-cut evidence from the Quran and Sunnah or the consensus of scholars. Mm. It's over. It's done with. So, what was the question? Uh, examples of ishtihad. Okay, ishtihad. so yeah. when we want to look into examples, pick and choose. Let's go for forms of worship. Okay. So we have prayer. Mm -hmm. The prayer is the same as it was at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Nothing changed. Dhuhr is four, Asr is four, Maghrib is three, Isha is four, Fajr is two. No change at all. But when it comes to giving the answers, so someone says, I live in a, a, an apartment and whenever I turn the faucet on, uh, the water comes yellow due to the rust from the pipes, mm -hmm. whether it's a uh, pig iron or uh, whatever uh, kind of iron it is made of. So what's the ruling on my wudu? Someone says, ah, this is not water because we know that water has no color, no taste, and no odor too. But this has color. Here comes the juror and says, no, let's look into it. Is it still water or not? So if it's water that has changed with a pure substance, then yes, you can use it. But if it has changed with an impurity, such as urine or uh, uh, defecation, mm -hmm. or it has lost the name of water, as in the case when you put a tea bag into it and it becomes tea, not water anymore. In this case, yes, you cannot perform wudu. The ruling, as we've stated, uh, regarding for prayer, um, praying on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Though some of the Hanafi scholars and other schools of thought had come up with this before they've created the airplanes and said that if someone was standing on a swing, so he's in between and he's unable to touch the floor and, and, and so on. So they gave the verdict again to uh, uh, such an incident. I'll give you a clearer example. Mm -hmm. We know that we have to pray five prayers a day. Okay. Break of dawn, after the zawal, after the shade of an erected object is the same length as it is mm -hmm. after sunset, after the dis disappearance of the redness uh, uh, at the twilight when the sun, after the sun sets. But what is the ruling for those living in Scandinavian countries okay. where they have like six months of all day uh, uh, long uh, sun and six months when they don't have sun at all? Yeah. So one would say, wow, man, they're lucky. They're not going <laughs> to pray like for six months or they're going to pray one prayer. Yeah. This is something that needs ishtihad. We look at the Quran and Sunnah. These countries are not mentioned. Mm. So one says, ha ha, then Islam is not fit for every time and every location. Say, nope, this, this is, is wrong. Ishtihad comes, in. ishtihad comes in. And look at the jurors, how they reach the uh, ishtihad. When the Prophet ﷺ, told us about the Antichrist, mm. the Dajjal. He said that he will stay on earth for 40 days. One day is equivalent to a whole year. Another day is equivalent to a month. A third day is equivalent to a week. And the rest of the 37 days are like your normal, normal days. days. The Sahaba neglected all the tribulations and, and tests that he would bring. The first question was, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what should we do about Salah? Ya akhi, this is mind-blowing. The companions hearing and learning about this phenomena, who is so devious and deviant, he says, I am your Lord. He says that he's Allah and he orders the heavens and it rains and he orders the earth and it grows uh, uh, food and crops and he gives life to people who he, he had killed. So it's, it's a tribulation. Yeah. It's the greatest fitna mankind had ever witnessed. Yet the companions were not bothered. Mm. They wanted to know about prayer. They wanted to know about prayer because they knew how important prayer is in Islam. So they said, okay, 
one year, a day is equivalent to one year. What should we do on that day? Should we pray the prayer of one day, meaning only five prayers in 365 days? Mm. The Prophet said, no, Alayhi He said, estimate it by time. By time. Meaning that you have to estimate at 24 hours, these are five prayers, I should perform them mm. in a 24-hour span. The scholars came to this issue and said, aha, uh -huh, voila. So we extract it from here? Exactly. So we go to the people in the Scandinavian countries far north and say, Achi, if you have six months of daytime or of nighttime, then you have to pray the prayers every 24 hours and okay. try so to divide it yeah. accordingly. Either, and this is a room for ishtihad, either look to the closest country mm -hmm. to you that has day and night and pray as they pray on the same timings, same time. or they bring other suggestions and Allah Azza knows best. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for that very clear cut example actually. Uh, dear viewers, uh, the Shaykh has given us a wonderful example and gave us two, three examples of uh, modern day ijtihad. Now what we're going to do is go for a short break and as soon as we come back we will speak about who is allowed to conduct ijtihad. So stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Contemporary Islamic Issues. And before we went for this short break, we were speaking about different examples of modern day ijtihad. And we said that when we get back from the break, we will get into who is allowed to conduct ijtihad and who is not. So, Sheikh, uh, in the first part of the show, you mentioned that not everybody's ijtihad is valid. Not everybody understands the verses from the Quran, from the Sunnah, the same way that another person might understand it. And you gave examples that some of the companions misunderstood something and would be corrected by the Prophet ﷺ and by the vast majority of the companions. So the question is, who is allowed to conduct ijtihad? How do we know this person is capable of ijtihad? How do we know this person's ijtihad is valid and another person's is not? Who is allowed to conduct this ijtihad? Okay, scholars have talked about this and discussed it thoroughly, but I, I'm afraid that I may confuse the viewer maybe confuse myself if I go into real deep details mm -hmm. because they uh, divide uh, the mujtahid, the person doing ishtihad into being mujtahid mutlaq or mujtahid muqayyad or mujtahid who may seek the assistance of others to help him put an ishtihad. And basically speaking, the person who does ishtihad has to be knowledgeable in the issue that he is making ishtihad in. You cannot have someone doing ishtihad and not knowing the other opinions of scholars. See, if someone is making a verdict or giving a fatwa based on the Quran and Sunnah, which is crystal clear to him, and he can argue any different opinion with it, there's no problem in that. But if it is something that is dubious, something that is, you know, vague. And he simply picks an opinion of a scholar and he adopts it. But he doesn't know the other opinions that may be stronger than his. This person cannot make ishtihad. He may relay, he may relay this fatwa mm -hmm. to a specific scholar saying that this is the fatwa of Sheikh Ibn Baz, of mm -hmm. Ibn Ithameen, but not to say it from his own uh, a pocket as they say yeah. without knowing it and the things surrounding it so we have this kind of category but again the viewer may not be interested in knowing that a mujtahid has to be knowledgeable of the ruling of the quran and the sunnah mm -hmm. he has to be knowledgeable of the other opinions of that scholars on that go at, on the same issue but may differ with his fatwa and thirdly, he has to know the circumstances of nowadays, which is known as al-waqir. Mm -hmm. So knowing the Quran and the Sunnah, but being unable to implement it on today's problems, this doesn't give you the, 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 the right to, to do ishtihad. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. There are so many uh, issues in medicine mm -hmm. that were not there at the time of the Prophet. So, for example, 
if someone is hooked to a ventilator, to a, a, a heart uh, a machine, uh, a dialysis, etc., and his family comes and say, pull the plug. Well, this is killing him. Yeah. So what's the ruling on that? If the person doing ishtihad is not knowledgeable of the medical aspects, whether this uh, comma is forever because the brain cells are dead, mm -hmm. or it may recover because we've seen people in a coma for like 10 years, years and, and then they wake up. Mm -hmm. But there are uh, people who uh, get a coma and there's no way of being revived because their brain cells are dead. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So he's in a vegetative, uh, vegetated, I think they, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, a state. So a mufti cannot say, yes, pull the plug or keep the plug on. It's been 60 years, Sheikh. No, it's no problem. Maybe Allah Azza wa will create a new brain for him. What is this? He has to be aware of the uh, medical. Uh, medical terms mm -hmm. and consequences. Likewise, for example, a beautiful research on the pills that people with heart attack and strokes take when they have a stroke. They put it under their tongue. Their tongue. So does this break your fasting or not? Mm. So our scholars who do not have ishtihad said, yeah, anything you consume con uh, 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 breaks your breaks fasting. Your Others say, what about the inhaler for those who have asthma? Mm. So if I inhale it, would I break my fasting? Said, yeah, anything that goes into your cavity would uh, uh, be considered to be breaking, uh, uh, breaking your fast. But it is not. But because you do not know the medical um, aspects mm. related to this issue, they gave the wrong fatwa. So ishtihad has to be a combination of all for a person to give uh, uh, such a verdict. Mm. That's quite interesting. So would you say that, uh, for example, obviously there's people who can do ishtihad, uh, and you said those that understand the Quran and Sunnah know the various opinions or all the opinions uh, as much as they can possible on the same issue that they are conducting ishtihad on. Now, aside from these people, the rest of the people that can't make ishtihad, do they do taqlid of these people? Do they ask these scholars what's going on and you know, take their opinion? Or do they have to make some sort of ijtihad? Well, if you look at what we had said in the uh, uh, previous five minutes, you know that if a person doesn't have knowledge in Quran and Sunnah, mm -hmm. how can he make his own ijtihad? Mm -hmm. So this means that he has to follow. Mm -hmm. But the $1 million question, well, dollars are plunging down. The one million <laughs> euro question, even euros, euros are. are going down as well. So let's go for pounds, maybe <laughs> British pounds is, is the highest. pounds. Well, well, <laughs> no comments on that. So we have a, a big issue is, as a layman, mm. who should I follow? follow? Now, we have two different schools. One says that you may follow whatever is easier, mm. but this is totally wrong because you would be then cherry picking. Yeah. So a man is sitting in his living room with like five, six remote controls in front of him. This is OCN, this is Orbit, this is Showtime, this is Nile Sat, this is Greek Sat, this is Israeli Sat, mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. People waste their time, waste their lives on nothing while remaining ignorant about their religion. Mm -hmm. His wife comes and says, I'm invited to a wedding tonight. But they have a musical band. So what's your ruling on going there? He said, gee, I don't know. Hmm. Let, let us see. So he turns on channel one. And this sheikh comes, music is haram, music is prohibited, music is this and that. Said, channel two. Hmm. Another scholar says, on that second channel, says, well, music is like birds humming. It's like waterfall you know, a uh, uh, very nice and, and beautiful, it calms you down. If you listen to uh, uh, Mozart or Beethoven or uh, Bach or whatever, you feel mellow. So it's inshallah halal. Mm. So it says, that, this one. that's the one. That's the one. And then she says, okay, tomorrow I'd like to travel to visit my parents in a different city. Mm. So I have to travel by plane. What's the ruling in that? He said, I don't know, let us check. Same. Channel one, 
the sheikh who made music haram, he says, traveling, if you are with the company of trustworthy people, without a mahram, is halal. So, mm -hmm. I'll take that. She says, but the second channel, what does he say? The one who made music halal. He said, who cares? Even if he says it's haram, we're going to take this one. Yeah. So you end up making, making and forging a new religion that is not related to Islam. Mm -hmm. Because you are picking the worst opinion and the mistakes of scholars and collecting it as a religion that you worship Allah with. Mm -hmm. So for a layman, he has to be selective. There are 10 scholars, Sheikh, who, who, whom should I who trust? Should I the right? one who is 6'4", or the one who has muscles, or the one who is fair in skin, or the one with the dark skin, or the one who speaks Arabic, or the one who is funny. No, mm -hmm. you should choose the one whom you trust his religion, his uh, uh, religious practice, his moral ethics, and you think that he is the most knowledgeable of them all. Whether you're right or wrong, this is to Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes. But Allah does not burden you with, with something you cannot bear. But it has to be a sincere choosing. Correct. And then you follow him throughout the whole nine yards. Okay. You don't go and pick, and pick different, different. if he says something that you don't like without any evidence. And I, I have a gut feeling. Gut feeling? Mm -hmm. What is this? <laughs> There's nothing as a gut feeling. You have to follow the scholar uh, as long as you trust him. Mm -hmm. And then... This is your excuse in front of Allah. Mm. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Uh, we're at the end of the program. Alhamdulillah, we had a wonderful short uh, conversation on Ijtihad, got a general view of what Ijtihad is, what's its purpose, and why it's used. So thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Asim and Hakim. Uh, dear viewers, I hope you've benefited from today's program. I've hoped you learned something new about Ijtihad that you didn't know before. And until next time, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa